My name is Dia Hui, and I'm from the Jane Goodall Institute of Singapore. So how do you guys feel about monkeys? Good. Nice. Good. No, not so bad. Okay, I'm seeing a variety of responses. All right, hold on. Hold on. What if I told you that we humans could be bodyguards for monkeys? So first, I'm going to show you a video that I made earlier this year about monkey guarding. Here's the video. If you live in Singapore, you've probably encountered the long-tailed macaque, the most common primate species in Singapore after humans. As they live on the fringes of the forest, homes located close to forest edges encourage them to venture into human spaces for food. Misconceptions about the macaques have resulted in calls for them to be euthanized, but culling is not a sustainable solution. In reality, the macaques will fill up an empty vacuum and the conflicts will continue. This is where monkey guarding comes in. Monkey guarding is a modern alternative solution that aims to peacefully discourage macaques from entering certain areas. By establishing the presence of monkey guardians as a barrier between macaques and a residential estate, the macaques will be deterred from entering residential units in search for food. Monkey guardians regularly patrol residences that are frequently targeted by macaques. When macaques try to enter a house, the monkey guardians block their path and guard or herd them away. They may make loud noises or use sticks to further reinforce deterrence. These tools are never used to hurt or confront the macaques, but to act as extendable arms. When it comes to monkey guarding, it is important to show respect. By being patient and giving them space, we can avoid conflict. Notice how the monkey guardian, Sabrina, is taking it one step at a time and maintaining a safe distance as she gives the macaques time to move. There is no need for aggression on our part, as macaques are naturally deterred by our larger size. In fact, being aggressive would only prompt the macaques to act out violently in defense of their troop, especially if you come too close to the young ones. Monkey guarding is an alternative. But it cannot stand alone. If you live in an area with many macaques, here's a few tips on how you can help to avoid conflict. Tackle the root cause of the problem by taking away their motivation, food. Ensure that food and plastic bags are kept out of sight so that the macaques will have no reason to approach your home in the first place. Most importantly, never feed the macaques or any other wild animal because it encourages them to approach humans in search of food, thus reversing their natural behaviour. Remember, they do have enough food in the forest. Shout it from the rooftops. We don't need to be aggressive in order to deter the macaques, and we certainly don't need to kill them. Let your friends know that there is a humane alternative to culling. Monkey guarding should only be carried out by volunteers who have been trained. If you would like to join in, don't hesitate to sign up for a training session at the Jane Goodall Institute Singapore website. You can also help out with our residential surveys to help us gather data on how the macaques interact with residents in targeted areas. These surveys will also allow us to better understand the ground sentiments towards the macaques. Here's some final advice. A foolproof way to stay safe around macaques is to keep your distance of 2-3 to three meters and don't stare at them. If they approach you, avoid running away or screaming. Ensure you back off gradually, widening the distance between you and the macaque. Singapore is their home too. Let's learn to adopt simple practices to ensure harmonious coexistence. Thank you. Okay, so once again, I'm Jia Hui. I'm a volunteer from the Jane Goodall Institute, and I'm also a student in environmental studies in the National University of Singapore. Uh, this last summer, from about June to August, I got to do an internship at the Jane Goodall Institute Singapore, and I got to do things like conduct forest surveys, that's me in the distance, 
And because I like drawing, I also got to do comics about the Raffles Bandit Langer, which is a native primate in Singapore. You can find this in the Raffles Bandit Langer Working Group Facebook page. Okay, so that's enough promotion for me. Part of the reason why I chose JGIS was because of Dr. Jane Goodall herself. Dr. Jane Goodall is a world-renowned primatologist who first discovered that chimpanzees can use and make their own tools. So this is an artist's rendition of a chimpanzee using tools. It's using a stick to poke into a termite mound, and then when the termites get disturbed, they crawl up the stick, and the chimpanzee has a nice termite kebab to enjoy. So there's that. And this was a huge discovery because before that, everyone thought that only humans could make tools. And that was sort of what set us apart from other animals. It was what made us human. So when Jane Goodall's mentor, Louis Leakey, heard about this discovery, he said, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Now this seems kind of drastic, but it's pretty true because now we have to rethink what it means to be human, right? And we have to rethink our relationship with other animals, including with primates, because they are so closely related to us. Today, primates such as chimpanzees are being driven to extinction because of human impacts like climate change and habitat loss. So could we live in harmony with nature and wildlife? One of the issues, nice. One of the issues um, that we are concerned about closer to home is the conflict between humans and macaques. So from the video, you have learned that some humans are calling for macaques to be culled. Right now, there are about 2,000 macaques in Singapore and about 5.6 million humans. So we outnumber them by quite a lot. But still, we are receiving a lot of complaints about the macaques. There's a macaque for you in case you forgot what it looked like. Okay, I believe that the first step towards solving this issue is to let people understand why macaques behave the way they do and also to why these conflicts arise in the first place. So we can start from the beginning. This is what Singapore looked like way, way back in the past. It's completely green, complete forest cover, everything's either swamp forest, mangrove forest, or lowland to carp forest. So the macaques could pretty much live anywhere they wanted, right? This is what Singapore looked like in 2007. So you can see that there's still some green, that's secondary forest, which is the light green parts on the map. But because of decades of deforestation, we have mm, not so much mature old forests as before. That's the dark green parts of the map. And this is important because the mature forest is where most of the food and shelter is. So now we can see that the macaques have a lot less available habitat to live in than before. And you'll also see around the central region, it's surrounded by the black areas, which is urban areas like houses, schools, roads, and so on. And you'll see why that's a problem later. Keep your eyes on the central region of the map. So this also coincides with the macaque hotspots. Now you see the connection. This is especially um, important because macaques are forest edge dwelling creatures. This means that they live on the boundaries between the urban areas and the forest. Looks good, right? I think it looks good. They think so as well. Macaques are attracted to human food because it's much higher in energy, such as sugar and fats, than the natural food that they can find in the forest, such as jackfruit, fig, and chimpanduck. So if a macaques have access to human food, that means that they can spend much less time and energy laboriously looking through the forest for natural food, and they can come to humans for food instead. So this is what happens, especially if you remember that cats and humans are neighbors pretty often, especially if humans live around that central region that we saw earlier. Sometimes macaques don't even need to break into our homes to steal food. Now this is orange peel left over from when someone left oranges near the forest on purpose for the macaques to eat. There are a lot of people who are feeding the macaques on purpose, and this is because they're doing it out of pity or sympathy for the macaques, but it doesn't really help them in the long run. You see, if we feed macaques 
too often, they'll eventually become used to human presence. And when they become used to human presence, they become braver and they dare to come near us, to go into our homes, and even to act aggressively to us. It makes sense, right? Like if the macaque was like, hey, remember that time the human gave us some like mummy noodles or something and it was super delicious and super easy? We should try that again. And the next time they see a human, they know that they can go to that human looking for food, which is not great. So it might seem that from what I talked about earlier that a lot of the times it's because of the humans that these conflicts arise. And you wouldn't be wrong because from the data you can see here, a lot of the times when humans and macaques interact, it's because the humans approach them first, either to feed them or to provoke them. And this isn't just limited to the actions of a few individuals. This goes back to decades of deforestation, where we cut down forests, we build homes where the macaques used to live. When the macaques come looking for food, some of us feed them. So this might seem a little depressing, but on the bright side, if we humans are part of the problem, it means that we can also be part of the solution. That's why we are working so hard on our monkey guarding projects, and that's why I'm here talking to you today. So if you're looking for ideas on how to contribute to this issue and how to make it better, you can consider joining JGIS. So here are some of our programs that we'll go through now. Under primates, we have monkey walks, which are free guided tours for the public, where we bring them to places where the macaques live, like Macritchie or Bukit Timah Nature Reserve, and we observe them in their natural habitat and share our knowledge about the macaques, like their behavior, what their facial expressions mean, things like that. Dr. Jane Goodall once said this, only if you care, only if you know, would you care. Only if you care, would you do something about it. We believe that it's important for people to go out into nature themselves, to appreciate it, and then to learn how to care for it. So that's why we do our monkey walks. Next, we have monkey guards, which you've heard about already. This is some newspaper feature that we had earlier this year. Next, we have the Langer Citizen Science Program. This is a program where members of the public, like you and me, can join to help us in researching the raffles banded Langer in Singapore. It is a critically endangered leaf-eating primate that is native to Singapore. And I'm not surprised if you've never seen it or even heard of it because there's only about 50 individuals left in our forests. And that's really little. I myself had never seen the Langer before until this year, and I did my internship with JGIS. I spent about 10 weeks looking for the Langer in the forest, several times a week, every week, and it was only until my last two weeks in the internship when I finally spotted them. So they, I was on the road, and there was this big tree next to me, and then the Langers were on the tree all of a sudden. And then I was under the tree, one of them just suddenly started running across the branch overhead. And it was so close that I could hear its footsteps going boom, 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 boom on the trunk above me. And then within a few seconds, it was gone. These are very agile creatures. They move very freely through the, through the canopy. It's like they're flying. So I highly recommend you join this program because if you do, you'll get a chance to see these langers in their natural habitat. And you'll see how fast they can jump. All right. Next, we have Roots and Shoots. This is a program where JGIS collaborates with students from primary school all the way to university level, and it helps them to initiate their own projects that are for animal welfare or for environmentalism. And this can count towards your VIA as well. So last year, we had a student called Ben Chong, who was primary five at the time. He decided to start his own research project where he went out to observe macaques in their natural habitat, and he wrote down, recorded their behavior, and he found that they spend 20% of their feeding time eating human food, and 80% of their feeding time eating natural food. Then he presented his findings at the 2017 Roots and Shoots Conference, where Dr. Jane herself was in attendance. So that's really cool. Next, we have public talks. Uh, we have a lecture series where we invite primate researchers from all over the world to talk about their experiences and their research. So just last October, we had Dr. Deus, who is from the Gombe National Park in Tanzania. 
he came to talk about his research in the very same national park where Dr. Jane Goodall first conducted her own research. And you can read about his experiences on the JGIS blog. Okay, so these are our social media icons and you can follow us there. So for updates on our activities and our events, you can consider giving a donation at janegoodall.give.asia. Now, I know it seems kind of difficult and maybe even impossible to follow in the footsteps of Dr. Jane Goodall because she's such a great person and she did such groundbreaking work. But if you think about it like this, we can start small. So I started with JGIS, and I hope you decide to do so as well. Thank you.